Look inside yourself and see what it is that you want to say as an artist. But just be like, how am I going to say what I want to say and do it my way and be unique and be a voice? Dave, I get a call from Greg Bissonnette. <laughs> he says, and whenever Greg calls, whatever he says, I'm with him because Greg is just an absolutely wonderful person and a fantastic musician. Yep. He says, you gotta sit down with Dave. <laughs> he says, because he, he, the, how he thinks about drums and music is so different. He said, I'm taking some lessons with him, so the fact that you've inspired so many great people in this industry, Thank you so much for joining oh, us and being here, for sure. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me, man. Mars Volta, I mean, I heard some of the recordings of what you, I mean, you have such an, a different approach in how you play, such an energy and a drive. Thanks. Where did music first enter your life as a kid? My dad was always playing music around the house, a lot of jazz. I think sort of music stopped for him maybe around like 1965, <laughs> you know? So a lot of Frank Sinatra, a lot of Miles, a lot of Benny Goodman, like uh, just a ton of jazz. Yeah. Uh, I grew up in this really small town called Sebastopol, we were talking about, yeah. and there was this really small coffee house called Coffee Cats. There was this piano player named Bob Lucas, and Benny Barth played drums, and Tom Shader played upright bass, and it was this tiny little, I mean, it was like half the size of this room, <laughs> and we'd go there every Tuesday night, and they'd just do trio stuff, and I just loved it. And Bob, uh, the piano player, he's, he's passed away since then, but he was like really, into the fact that I was, come, you know, some eight-year-old kid or whatever coming out and just checking out jazz <laughs> every week and, and we hit it off and we developed a relationship and I had a friend who had a drum kit and I would just go over to his house and hang out and then one day I sat down, I was like nine or something and I was like, yeah, this is kind of easy. I can feel like I could maybe do this, you know? And then that was just it. It just came over, you know? And, and did you take lessons at that yeah. point? Yeah, so he had a teacher, so I was just like, well, I'll just sit in on your lessons. And then we sort of split it up half and half, and then I got hooked, and then I started taking lessons. And my first teacher was this guy named Eric Wiedenheimer. And he, to his credit, totally got me into the right stuff out of the gate. Got right. me doing all the Ted Reed stuff. Great. All the, all the Gary Chester stuff. The book Syncopation, Gary yeah. Chester's was New Breed, exactly. all these great books. Excellent. Yeah, when, you're, when I'm like 10. And so, you know, he really got me set on the right track and uh, got me reading and I kind of went through, I was just like really into it. So I just yeah. went through everything like voraciously and I was like 12 and he was like, dude, I don't know what to do with you. I kind of <laughs> did everything. So, you know, there was a couple other teachers in the, it's just, you know, small area, so there weren't a lot of people available, but I sort of taught myself and my, High school band directors, guy Vance Regan. There was a great, great high school music program. So he was so committed. I mean, this is something we'll probably get into later, but there's no budget for music programs in schools a lot of the time. We times, are being right? challenged now, and many people that I have sat opposite me in this chair have said how much importance of a school band music program was to them for their career right now, Huge. and we are losing it now. So. Yeah, yeah, it's very mm -hmm. important that those that those programs yeah. still happen, especially at that formative age, yeah. where your brain's developing, your social in interactions are developing, those sort of that sort of skill set. He was so committed to the integrity of the program that we did zero period jazz band because mm -hmm. there was no money for it. He's like, you know what, if you guys want to do this, I'll show up at 5.30 every morning before school starts. So I'm <laughs> sitting there trying to play like Stella <laughs> by Starlight like at 5.30 in the morning every morning uh, before school started. And then, you know, the classical program and honor band and all that stuff. And that was really important for, mm. for my development. So, and I've had teachers here and there and I got hooked up with this guy, Jason Gianni, who teaches at The Collective. I know Jason very yeah. well. I've performed with him many times. Great. Yeah. Great so, player. Yeah, yeah, so he used to live in the Bay. So he would drive an hour and a half up to my mom's house every other week and we'd spend like three, four hours together. And he taught me from when I was like 16 until I moved to LA when I was like 19. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Jason is fantastic. Teaching still at the Collective in New York yep. and a phenomenal player. Yep. But that's great that you had that kind of education. So were there many other books that you went through? Was it like book learning to a large degree? It was both. I sort of structured things where I would go, okay, I'm going to work on this page in this book and get it to the point where it's really happening. Mm -hmm. Like I can get through the whole page, whatever it was, like just random example. I'm going to get from line one to line five straight through without stopping at a specific tempo perfectly 10 times in a row. So yeah. I get seven times like, ugh, like do it again. Like it was pretty, get kind of crazy sometimes. <laughs> and sort of as a way to reward myself, I'd play along to records. 
So I do whatever I had to do, and then I'd be like, okay, now I can put on Genesis or you know, Meshuggah or Tool or or Mahavishnu or Buddy Rich or whatever. Yeah. So it was a it was a combination of books, but also what I call what I do with my students sound like ear training. Right. Not in the classical sense of like music school, like is this a major third or a minor third? It's like, no, like here's this beat, play it right now right. as accurately as possible because you know, if you ask Greg, you know, <laughs> like that's what you have to do in real life. Absolutely. You walk into a you walk into a studio, they're like, here's the demo, chart it out. Absolutely. Go for it. No one has time is money. Absolutely. And they might ask for a specific style or even a specific drummer. Or yep. in a specific album and maybe even a specific song. So yep. having that kind of information, which is what you went through, was very valuable. Yeah, and having to have a mental Rolodex of not only different different drummers' vocabularies, but maybe different producers, right. different drum tones, different right. different room sounds, right. and being able to go through your head and be like, oh, okay, they want this kind of a... Uh, sort of you put all these things in a row, like this producer, this room, this era, this drummer, this drum kit, yeah. and we're able to kind of put all those things into order so that when you show up, like when I did that that Trolls soundtrack with Justin Timberlake, yeah. he was like, hey man, we want like a disco 70s vibe. And I went in my head, I was like, da, 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 you know, and I showed up and I'm like, snare drum, control sound, tape all over it, right. tune way down, right in the middle, no rim shot, and I throw everything up, he's like, and I'm like, how is that? And he's like, sounds great, man. Don't touch anything. Like, let's go. Like, hit record. Because if you show up and you don't have that stuff already happening, you got to sit there and tinker. And then they're like, man, did we call the right guy? Preparations. I mean, that, that, that preparation. Boy, it sounds like you're a very disciplined and organized person. Yeah. And that's great qualities because that's where success has its, has its greatest reward. So, what, so now you're practicing. You're going through all this here. Are you playing with different bands at this time? It's interesting. I've always liked a huge variety of music, and I think that's very important. Yeah. So I was always sort of juggling these, they're spinning all these different plates where it was like, well, I love jazz, but I also love really heavy metal, and I also love like just instrumental piano. I love everything. So <laughs> when I started thinking about like what kind of music I wanted to do, like in an original setting, it was yeah. like, it was, it was tough, you know, because I sort of identify with a lot of different things. But one thing that'll happen is people will sort of sort out for you what you're best at, right? So I can play straight ahead because I grew up doing that, but I get called for a lot of rock or pop stuff, yeah. like hard hitting yeah. stuff. And I'm probably better at that, you know? <laughs> so when I first moved here uh, when I was 19, I did a five week summer performance program at Berkeley when I was in Boston when I was 17 to be like, do I want to, I'm supposed to go to school here, right? Right. Do I want to go to school here? This is what I'm supposed to do. So I did the five week performance program, which was cool. I met a lot of people there, but I quickly realized this is a big waste of money at 17. For you. I mean, for and, me. And, exactly. And that's what happens with certain people. Sometimes it's certain colleges are just not right for them. Well, for the amount of money that you have to spend. Right in exchange for what you're getting back. Mm. And this goes to what we were talking about earlier. It's like no one explains to these 18 year old kids how debt works, right? right? So you go to, to Berkeley or USC or any of these schools and it's 60 or $70,000 a year. Absolutely. You go there for four years, you're never getting out from under that. You can't even pay down the principal. So really what people need when they go to an, an institution is they need someone like a personal trainer, like right. do two more reps. Yeah, right. it's not good enough. <laughs> so like I was like, I can get that studying with someone privately, mm -hmm. right? And both you and I have done that for a long time. Absolutely, so yeah, yeah. that relationship is really what people need. So I figured out like, I don't need to spend all this money. I can yeah. just get, some, get like a mentor in Los Angeles yeah. or wherever. So yeah. now if your parents set aside a, a fund for you, for college and you don't have to pay for anything. Different story. Yeah, totally different, <laughs> different story. story yeah. yeah, knock yourself out, you know, <laughs> like have fun. So anyway, so I met a guitar player there named James Malakowski who was like, hey man, I'm going to USC for elect electrical engineering. Why don't you just move to LA and we'll start a band? So that was what got me down here. And, and then a friend of mine, my, my buddy Leo, I was like, hey man, I'm moving to LA in two weeks. You can kind of sing. Do you want to sing in this band? And he's like, yeah, why not? <laughs> so it was just the three of us. Moved down to LA when I'm 19, and, and then here, 15 here years since. later, yeah. <laughs> so it was like kind of a metal band thing, and and that ran its course and didn't really go anywhere. And 
And then I did this band called Daughters of Mara, which was on Virgin Records. Right, the Daughters of Mara. Yeah. Right, right, right. right and right. we did that record with Garth Richardson in Canada, like kind of the last era where you can do like a big budget major label record. Right. So, you know, several hundred thousand dollars. So that was an amazing experience. You know, Garth's done like Rage Against the Machine and produced all these big records. So tracking drums at Brian Adams studio in, in Vancouver and spending three months doing a record, like going to Canada for three months, yeah. like living at the studio, that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. So unfortunately when the record was about to come out, EMI got bought out by a hedge fund company and just ran into the ground. So if you weren't the Beatles or Coldplay or something, you kind of didn't really survive. So that band just kind of got shelved, which mm. is what happens in that major label right. context sometimes. Right. But it was an amazing experience. I learned a ton from doing it. Yeah, and then I got the Mars Volta gig when I was 25 and that put me on the map. And how'd that come about now? They parted ways with the previous drummer. They had an upcoming tour, like soon yeah so they called like a lot of people you know some of them are pretty big name dudes yeah. uh, friends of ours and they were just scrambling to get someone i think maybe from when they fired the previous drummer to like the first show it was maybe like three weeks Juan, the the bass player we had some mutual friends uh, one of them being garth richardson the producer from that record <laughs> yeah. so you know you networking never, at its best yeah you never know how this <laughs> stuff's gonna come around Absolutely. you know so he came over and brought another incredible bass player named Jonathan Hishke with him to just sit down right in front of me and have another set of eyes to like watch me while he's playing with me. So it was pretty in intimidating. <laughs> and he was just like, hey, do you know this song? Do you know this song? Do you know this song? We were just like jamming. And I was, I was, I dude, I'd never play along to any of those songs ever. I was just a fan of the band. And I was like, I think I can kind of figure, I think, you know, so I fumbled my way through it. He was like, okay, this is, this is cool. He's like, what about this song, Elvia? And it's just like a pocket, like down-tempo song. And as soon as we started playing, he's like, all right, dude, that's it. That, that, that's it. Like, I'm going to call Omar right now. Like, let's do it. And my point is everybody loves to talk about that band because it's technically very complex music. Yeah. But the, the clincher was that song is all pocket. Yeah. And if that doesn't feel good, it's not going to work. Nothing else matters. Right? right so even with a band like that where it's very progressive technical music it doesn't matter unless it sits right yeah omar and i the guitar player were having lunch you know months later and he was like do you know why i picked you to, to do this and i was like yeah you know i don't know like <laughs> shoot you know and he was like you, he's like out of all of the people that we called all of the people that sent in videos all the auditions like out of hundreds of people it's like you were literally the only person that had a video of you playing pocket mm. like that's it just <clears throat> <laughs> just that, nothing else. And my point is, is people love to all the chops and stuff, and but what really matters is the real foundational playing of the of the song. Yeah, the is, feel, feel, the yeah, pocket. Because yeah, yeah. people love the pyrotechnics and razzle dazzle and stuff. But yeah. even in a band that has very complex music, if it doesn't sit right, it doesn't. Nothing matters. Yeah. You know. So that that band was was huge for me. That really put me put me out there, put me on the map, put me on people's radar. Who would you say, naming specifically drummers, yeah. that influenced you in your playing? I mean, it's cliche, but I think Tony Williams is the greatest uh, ever. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Tony Williams, Phil Collins, Abe Cunningham, Vinnie Paul, Vinnie Caliuta, yeah. Yogi Horton. Yeah. Anybody that has this attitude that's just like, this is me just putting it all on the line, like 100% committed. Like when I hear something that gets me excited, that makes me want to just like run through a, a, a brick wall, you know what I mean? And someone who puts that into the music, like Phil Collins has that in spades. Absolutely. You know, and that's, and same with Tony, that's their, yeah. and Gad, yeah. you know, like it's, and Steve Jordan. Steve's and even though, even though they're very different players. Absolutely. That ingredient of being able to commit yeah. to the serving of that song at that point, that's powerful. Yeah, and, in, and, and using your identity to serve the song yeah. and prop it up, you know? Like that to me is, that's the whole point of doing this, is to have an identity and be like, look, this is who I am and this is how, this is the lens with which I see the world and I'm filtering all of that through this instrument. And having a voice is the most important thing, yeah. it's paramount. You don't yeah. want to sound like you're chasing someone else's coattails or some watered down version of someone else. Right. You know, that's, that defeats the purpose of, 
of all of this. How do you adapt to the changing music industry? Yeah, that's tough because time is moving faster than it ever has mm. before. It's like I make a joke all the time with those music business books. It's like they have to rewrite them every six yeah, months, absolutely. you know, because yeah. they get outdated yeah. so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to pay attention to how everything's evolving. I think nowadays, more than any other time, you have to be multifaceted. So I luckily have been teaching since I was 15, you know, so and I love doing it. Yeah. Even if I was a multimillionaire, I'd still do it because I love doing it. But my point is, is if I didn't teach, I'd have to go get some other job right. somewhere, you know. So I teach, I do tours, I do recording sessions, I do clinics, I do film scores. But you have to really do everything. The idea of someone like Jim Gordon or something where it's like, yeah. I'm just doing recording sessions. Yeah. The days like, are gone. It's gone. The days are gone. When Vinny and Fries and Abe Jr. are out on tour, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like those are the studio dudes. Yeah. When those guys are out on tour, that, that shows you how, how much things have changed. Yeah. So you really have to pay attention to, to how things are changing and how rapidly they're changing and just be like, look, I, what can I do? Mm. Like, what, uh, like don't, don't be like, I'm only doing this or I'm only doing that. Like, you gotta do a little bit of everything. And, you know, there's something to be said maybe for having some sort of income source like entirely outside of, of music. So that when you play music, you're 100% emotionally invested in it. Like I tell kids in their 20s, like maybe they go to MI or something and they get out of school and I'm like, well, they're like, I gotta get a day job now. And I'm like, that's cool. Don't work at a music store <laughs> because you're gonna be selling drums all day. And then when you get off work, you're not gonna be like, man, I wanna play drums. Yeah. You're gonna be like, ah, I'm looking at snare drums all day, right. you know? Yeah. Yeah. So there's something to be said in 2018 for just being like, I'm just gonna get some job. I gotta just pay the bills, like whatever. And then you, it, you're just compartmentalized, yeah. you know? And that sounds like kind of a downer, but I'm just trying to be realistic for, Listen, for people. The, the, the realistic way where the music industry is heading, mm -hmm. you've got to be aware of it, and yeah. you've got to be able to adapt and change immediately. You talked about education. I, myself, I love teaching. I've been doing it for 47 years mm -hmm. now, and I love it. It's, ex it's totally empowering for me. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about your teaching program when, when you're teaching privately. I sort of specialize in like technique body mechanics, essentially trying to eliminate as much of the body from the equation of movement as possible. I wanna trim the fat, I wanna sculpt the, the marble, and I want you to be as efficient as possible solely so you can emote without it being stuck somewhere, right? right? right, right. So the technique stuff is interesting and sort of dangerous because it's really easy to fall down the rabbit hole. Well, this, this fulcrum or this molar or German or French or whatever, and then people don't even know who they are anymore, <laughs> you know, like, because they get so lost in it, yeah, you know? Yeah. I'm trying to do the technique, body mechanics, things for good and not evil. Meaning like, look, this is so when you get relaxed and centered and grounded, your feel is better. Right. Not so you can have the world's fastest hands or right. something. You know right. what I mean? That's, right. that's pointless, right. missing the point, right? So I'm fortunate enough where I've developed a reputation with that, where I work with a lot of, you know, big name contemporary working drummers. And what's special about that is I do these things with them and then they go out and do really large world tours. Mm. And they might go, oh, this is different and weird. But then in a month they go, oh my God, dude, like I don't have blisters anymore. <laughs> yeah. My arms don't hurt. I can play two <laughs> sets if I wanted to. Great. Like the proof's in the, in the pudding. Yeah. So that's the kind of stuff I specialize in uh, with a lot of working pros. But you know, I always do whatever the person needs. Yeah. So if someone's like, hey, I just want to talk about the music business or I Beautiful. just want to go over complex phrasing. Beautiful. Whatever someone needs, but that's sort of the thing that I've developed a reputation for with like big name working drummers. Absolutely, and it's out there, man. You're doing fantastic with getting word out that the results that you're getting, yeah. it works. Thanks. That's the end all. Yeah. That's the end all. Yeah, that's all that matters. If they're getting results, Dave's the guy. Mm -hmm. Tell me what motivates you. What, 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 what drives you each day? Well, you know, as you know, as a teacher, that process is really rewarding. Hmm. Having, seeing the light bulb go on, like in someone go, yeah. oh, whoa, like that, like, like feeling some new sensation or having some, something click, like maybe they've been playing their whole lives, but they never knew how to read. And then they now know what a 16th note is and they go, <laughs> oh my God, you know, that's a, that's a cool yeah. thing to be a part yeah. of, you know, it's yeah. a very rewarding thing. 
And I'm lucky enough to do that with like friends of mine, which is beautiful. You know, I just taught a friend of mine yesterday and who I've known for years. And it was the first lesson I, he was like, oh, I want to go over some of this stuff with you. And something as simple conceptually as like, maybe like not pumping your left leg, like automatically and just <laughs> leaving it. Cause he was one of those guys that did that. And I'm like, that's cool. That's a thing, right? But let's not do that at all. Yeah. And then he started playing the same groove and his whole pocket was just like, Oh, uh, like the whole thing just like sat in a totally different way. Great. And we were both like, whoa, that's crazy. <laughs> so like, that's what keeps me going, you know, having that ability to, to help people. And then, you know, right now I'm teaching a lot, but I do do a lot of tours and sessions and that stuff's really fun when it, when it comes up too. It's just a different thing. Absolutely. So there's a nice balance to that. Yeah. You know, there's always the balance of keeping our, our artistic playing at a certain level and then the business side, mm -hmm. what it takes to hit the computer, respond to people, mm -hmm. be on social media, mm -hmm. answer the emails, answer the phone calls, get back to people. How do you balance the business side of all this? It's hard and it's really important. Mm. I wish I could just throw my phone in the ocean <laughs> a lot of times. I'm with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really active on Instagram. I'm not really as active on any other platform, mm -hmm. but I don't ever want to post something just because I feel like I'm supposed to. Yeah. I want there to be a reason for everything. Mm -hmm. I see so many people posting things that it's so, it's so transparent that they're like yeah. posting things for the sake of posting things. <laughs> and then there's just so much content out there it, and it's all very shallow. Yeah, it's Con overwhelming. Yeah. yeah, there's no reason for it, yeah, right? Yeah. So I think that's the most important thing is when you're gonna post something, there needs to be a concrete reason for it. Like, uh, you need to be saying something by doing it. Every time I post something on my, on my Instagram, there's a reason for it. I, you know, if it's like a part of a documentary I've been watching or a book I've been reading. Mm. The last three, four years maybe I've gotten away from, from drums and music a lot in what I post because I find that everybody just has their blinders on and they get stuck in this drum world yeah. and there's so many mm. other things available to you and everything is interrelated yeah. and once you can see the bigger picture, things are going to be deeper and make a lot more sense when they're reinforced in different areas, different mediums, right? Beautiful. Beautiful. So, that's what I try to do with my social media and just generally not look like a cheese ball. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, it's so difficult with social media because we, we have to be present with it. So we have to be attentive to it. Yeah. And it takes time during yeah. the day to organize. So do you organize yourself as far as there's business time, there's artistic time, there's practicing time, there's teaching time? Well, the only sort of routine I have is in the morning where I'll get up, I'll take my vitamins, I'll go back, sit down, and I meditate every every morning, and that's really important for me. Great. And then I have a bunch of espresso, go to the gym, <laughs> leave my phone in the locker. That's also really important, yeah. having your phone not physically on you. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. You need time away from that, because even it being physically on you, even if you're not looking at it, that still is yeah. sucking it's away. connected to you. Sure. Yeah, sure. part of your energy. I do that, get out of the gym, and then I teach however many lessons, Skype or in person, I have to teach. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, sometimes I'll just be like, man, I am exhausted, and I'll just go home and eat dinner. But sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll try and practice and keep that going. That's the most difficult thing for me, is like after giving a lot of yourself for most of the day, you, it's hard to, it's like, man, I know I should practice right now, but I'm just tired, man. <laughs> so, so finding time to maintain, to do the maintenance yeah. work yeah. is the, probably the most difficult part for me. So it's the balance. It's the yeah. ultimate journey of that balance in life. And there has to be life stuff other than just drumming stuff since the life stuff is the bigger picture. And the more we enhance our life stuff, the better that drumming stuff and that music thing starts to happen. Exactly. Yeah, because if you're just sitting in a vacuum all the time, you're not being influenced by everything else, and right, that's the right. way it should be. And when you see people that are uh, sort of cutting themselves off from all those outside influences, whatever they're going to be coming up with, it's sort of stale, or it's, yeah, it's not really yeah. going to elicit any sort of emotional reaction. Yeah. You know, like. Everybody likes to compartmentalize things so much now, like, well, that's that, and this yeah. is this. And it's yeah. like, no, 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 it's all the same thing. Yeah. As long as it energizes you to make something, that's what it's all about, is making something. And that's another tangent, like, with the social media stuff and Instagram, people posting videos, it's a lot of, like, cover videos, which drive me crazy because you're just coattail riding. Absolutely. It drives me nuts. And then it's like, what are you actually making? 
people post videos, oh, I'm just working something out. I don't want to watch you practice. <laughs> I wouldn't want, want to have anyone watch me practice. <laughs> I want to see the end result. Yeah. I had interesting conversations with a lot of artist friends of mine because artists started posting like work in progress videos or pictures a few years ago. And I was like, man, I don't want to see that. It ruins the magic yeah. for me when I see you, how you're making it. Yeah, and yeah. the artists were like, well, it's interesting for us because we can see the process and how they're doing it. For me, I don't ever want to put anything out that's like half done. Right, right. I think there's a lot of that yeah, yeah. floating around. It's like, no, here it is. I'm going to present it to you, you know. But it, it feeds back, and I'm sort of ranting right now, but it yeah, but feeds back good. into the people just putting things out there for the sake of putting things out there. Absolutely, and, and it seems like most of the stuff that's out there is half done. Totally. You know, it, it, and, and that's something which, you know, you're talking about really kind of prepare what you're doing. If you're gonna post something, make it work, make it magic. Yeah, like it's life or death. That always blows my mind when I see people like, man, just kind of messing around with whatever. It's just like, I don't wanna, <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't wanna see that. And that, that, you know, back in the day there were gatekeepers and it was a big deal to do a video, yeah. to do a DVD or a VHS. Absolutely, yeah. You couldn't just roll in and be like, well, I don't know, like <laughs> I'm just kind of going to do this. Like you had to do your homework and Absolutely. have everything, you know, organized and charted out. And it, you make a, it, you know what it comes down to? It's like make a statement. Are you making a statement? Yeah. That's what matters. And I don't see a lot of that. Well, that's a great level of professionalism. It's a great standard to set. Yeah. We have these, you know, students that are watching this, that they look at this, they listen to it. In closing, what would you say to these people watching this here that could inspire them, that could give them maybe the hope and the direction to pursue their dream? Well, look inside yourself and see what it is that you want to say as an artist. And no matter how you do that, it doesn't matter. Don't, don't hyper categorize things, don't put things in boxes. Just be like, what is it that I want to say and how am I going to say that? And it might not even be on the drums. Mm. You know, it might be some sort of new medium or some combination. But just be like, how am I going to say what I want to say and do it my way mm. and be unique and be like a voice that people go, when I want this, I'm going to go to that person. You know, that's why everyone loves Tony and Gad yeah, so much yeah. because they're, they're pillars. They're the perfect examples of that. Like Tony was committed, <laughs> you know? Like when he switched to that big yellow kid, everyone was like, oh. for real? Oh. Like that's kind of a lot, oh, isn't it? Absolutely. I knew Tony, man. He was one dedicated son of a gun. Yeah. I talked to Greg about that when he studied with him. Yeah. And he had the same stories. of, And he was very, very committed. And yeah. there's no wrong answer. Mm -hmm. As long as you're in tune with what it is that you, with that core essence, like just make things. That's it. <laughs> well, your message is clear, and I must tell you, <laughs> on the cutting edge of 21st century drum set playing and education, you really are pushing the envelope forward. Thanks. For that, I thank you so much, and thank you for being here on the sessions, Dave. Thanks you for did great. Me, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah.